I'm honored to be here uh, among such a great group of speakers. I also apologize in advance. I do have a little bit of a frog in my throat. This is not my normal voice. Um, but I'm OK. I'm doing OK, just so you guys know. OK. <clears throat> so let me start off with a simple demonstration of predictive modeling. Um, so there's a well-known uh, public data set of breast cancer biopsies from the University of Wisconsin. Uh, it's 699 biopsies. Uh, each biopsy has nine measurements. And there's a label of benign or malignant uh, for each instance, for each biopsy. And so when you have labeled data, right, you have these measurements for each instance, and then you have a label for each instance, uh, it's fairly straightforward to do uh, supervised learning. And I've already taken the step of loading this data into BigML. There are 699 instances. Again, there are nine features, nine measurements, things like clump thickness, uniformity of cell size. Uh, I am not a doctor, so I don't actually know what each of these uh, features actually means. Uh, but that's OK. I'm just trying to do the analysis and sort of find these patterns in the data. Uh, so again, we have these nine features. And then we have this label at the end, which is uh, benign or malignant. And you can see that uh, uh, So two, class two is benign. So most of the data set is benign. And then class four is malignant. And that's the minority class here, right? There's this minority class in our data, which is malignant biopsies. And so it's very straightforward for me to just train a predictive model on this labeled data set. I just click a button. This is all happening in the cloud. Uh, a decision tree algorithm is examining the labeled data, trying to find patterns, uh, correlations um, that tell you what's benign and what's malignant. And the pattern that the decision tree finds is that if this variable um, un uniformity of cell size is more than two, then empirically 80% of that subgroup is malignant, right? And we're getting very good separation between the two classes here. That's what this, you want to see this uneven distribution, right? That means that your uh, model is telling you something useful. Then over here on the other side, uh, where uniformity of cell size is less than or equal to two, 95% of those are benign. Right? And again, this is what you want to see. You want to see this large separation between the classes. And I could get into, you know, I could do an ensemble. Uh, I could evaluate this model using cross-validation and all that kind of stuff. Suffice it to say, this pattern sort of leaps out at you, right, based on uh, whether uniformity of cell size is less than or equal to 2 or greater than 2. And by the way, the way these measurements are set up, it's on a scale of 1 to 10 where 1 is normal and 10 is uh, highly abnormal. So it kind of makes sense that when you have this highly abnormal measurement for this variable, um, that you're seeing a high frequency of malignants uh, in that data set. So OK, you know, that was kind of easy, right? <laughs> when you have a labeled data set uh, and the right tools, you can just press a button and you can get a predictive model that uh, helps you get insight into your data. So what if we don't have the labels? Uh, can we still get insight into our data if we don't know the class of each instance? Um, and what I'm going to demonstrate is um, BigML's anomaly detection feature. So I'm actually going to uh, go back to my data set. And I'm going to get rid of the labels of benign or malignant. So it's only going to leave me with uh, the nine measurements for each biopsy. And so I'm just going to deselect the label. And so now I just have this unlabeled data set. Right? Again, I've got these nine measurements. Each of them is on a scale of 1 to 10. 
but I don't have the labels anymore, so I don't know whether each bi biopsy is benign or malignant. And I can just go, and I can train an anomaly detector. And I'll explain how this algorithm works in, in a minute. Uh, but suffice to say, what we're doing right now, uh, BigML is looking for instances that look weird in some way. It's computing a weirdness score for each biopsy. And I'm going to output this data. And I'm kind of... I'm kind of blowing through this here, but suffice to say what I'm doing is creating a new data set that has the nine features and now the anomaly score at the end. So instead of the label, I now have this anomaly score. And you can see here, there's this thing called score at the end. And this is a measure of the weirdness of an instance on a scale from zero to one. And I'm gonna explain more about that in a minute. So now I'm going to go back and I'm going to train a predictive model on this data set. And again, I'm just going to click a button. I'm training a decision tree on this data set, but instead of the label of benign and malignant, I'm using the anomaly score as the output variable. And I get a decision tree. And interestingly enough, it finds the exact same pattern as we did when we had the labels. It finds that when uniformity of cell size is more than two, you tend to have uh, much more anomalous biopsies, right? We don't know that they're malignant. We might suspect that they are malignant if they're highly anomalous. And conversely, you have less anomalous biopsies over here if uh, this variable is less than or equal to two. So this is pretty interesting, right? It, for those of you who have played around with unsupervised learning, Right? It can be a real challenge to actually get insight into your data in the absence of these labels. Right? And so uh, this is kind of an ideal outcome for unsupervised learning that you're able to get the same insight. You're able to find the same pattern in your data um, you know, even if you don't have uh, the labels. And there's a lot of reasons that labels can be difficult to obtain. Right? It can be uh, very labor-intensive labor to actually label individual instances. In a lot of cases, you have to have human beings do it for you and all this kind of thing. And so, um, you know, in this case, it's great that we were able to find this pattern uh, in the absence of having the labels. So, let me explain what the algorithm just did, how we computed that anomaly score. Suppose you have... Um, just a bunch of data points here in two dimensions. And what we're going to do is uh, recursively partition the data set just by drawing random cuts on random axes. And what ends up happening is, let's say you have this data point here in the middle. You can see that you know, it's in kind of a dense area of the data set. Right? It's got a lot of neighbors close by. And if I just draw random cuts on random axes, I eventually am able to give this data point its own little box. And in this case, it took 10 cuts to actually isolate this data point in its own little box. And so you can see that that's actually a very objective measure of how anomalous a data point is, right? If it takes a lot of cuts to give it its own little box, that means it has a lot of neighbors close by, right? Now, for this data point out here, it only takes uh, four cuts. And again, you can see intuitively that uh, because this doesn't have a lot of neighbors close by, uh, it's going to take fewer cuts to actually isolate it in its own little box. And we do this for every data point in the data set. Right? So we're, we keep drawing these lines, branching out. We're actually doing this recursively. Right? So imagine just. Uh, a screen full of blue lines where each dot has its own little box. Um, uh, we call this an isolation tree. And what we've really just done is overfit a decision tree model to the data point, right? We've basically used a decision tree 
to memorize the data set. Normally, that's a bad thing, right? Normally, you don't want to overfit your model. Uh, in this case, we are doing that deliberately because of this useful property that decision trees have, right? That uh, a data point with uh, lots of neighbors is going to take more cuts to isolate. And a data point that's kind of more on the fringe is going to take fewer cuts to isolate. And again, that's a very objective, concrete measure of how anomalous a data point is. And uh, we do this for, say, 100 samples of the data, right? So this is actually a sample of the data. Um, and we end up with an ensemble, and it's called an isolation forest. And it is a model-based approach, right? You can think of it kind of like a random forest, except instead of very carefully trying to find the best split that like, separates your classes, you're just drawing random lines. Uh, and you're overfitting decision tree models to all these, you know, let's say, 100 different samples of the data. Um, and so when we actually compute that anomaly score, <clears throat> we are actually scoring this isolation forest. Right? We're actually uh, feeding a data point uh, into this ensemble of isolation trees, and we're computing this anomaly score on a, a scale from 0 to 1. Um, and so to recap, what did we actually just do, right, in the big picture? Like, what is this analysis that we just did? Forget about the algorithm. Like, what did we actually do? We started off with a labeled data set, and we found this pattern where uh, feature 2 was found to be important at a threshold value of 2, right? Feature 2 was that uniformity of cell size variable. We removed the labels. We replaced them with these anomaly scores. And again, we found the same pattern, right? We found that feature 2 was important at a threshold value of 2. And so on the surface, these two things seem very similar, right? In both cases, we're using a decision tree model to get insight into our data. And in both cases, the decision tree model is finding this pattern uh, for this particular feature at this particular value. Uh, but there's an important difference. And it gets down to what is a label? What is the actual definition of a label, just conceptually? And I would argue that a good working definition of a label is it's a clue from your knowledge domain that is not measured in your features. Um, and that might sound kind of obvious, right? Well, of course, you don't want to have leakage between the features and the output variable, right? Otherwise, why do the analysis? Um, but the interesting thing is, by this definition, the anomaly scores are not labels, because they only contain information about the closed world of our data set. Um, so again, when we're making those cuts and we're isolating data points, uh, we're basically coming up with a measure of um, a sort of local density near that instance. Right? We're coming up with a measure of how crowded um, the neighborhood is for a particular instance. That's kind of what the anomaly score measures. But an anomaly score is not a label. Right? It does not actually contain any information from the outside world. Right? It is simply telling us about the shape of our unlabeled data set. Right? I got rid of the labels of benign and malignant. Uh, malignant. I had these nine measurements. I computed these anomaly scores. These anomaly scores are telling me about the shape of the unlabeled data. They actually don't contain any information about the outside world. And so even though we're using a decision tree, when we're training that model on the anomaly scores, we are actually doing clustering, right? which is kind of a strange thing. You think of a decision tree as kind of a supervised algorithm. But in this case, we basically tricked it into doing unsupervised learning. And so uh, I'm very sorry, Mr. Decision Tree, but the matrix has you. You are living in a closed system. You actually don't have any information from the outside world. Uh, you're looking at these, uh, what you might think are uh, real labels. Actually, the anomaly scores are only telling you about the little closed world that you're living in. Um, and it kind of raises the question of uh, 
you know, what is the definition of supervised learning or unsupervised learning, right? I would argue that uh, this is determined not by the algorithm that you use, right? Because we just showed that you can trick a decision tree into doing clustering. Um, if you need to prove to yourself that that's clustering, just look at the inputs and the outputs. The inputs are unlabeled instances. The outputs are groups of unlabeled instances, right? We found a group of in unlabeled instances with a high anomaly score with that value greater than or equal to two. And we found a separate group with a low anomaly score with uh, the value of that feature less than two, right? So we just took unlabeled instances, we grouped them into groups. Um, so it's clear that this is actually unsupervised learning even though we used a decision tree model. And so I would argue it's not about the algorithm, uh, but it's rather about it, whether your data has real labels or not, by my definition. And that's really the difference between supervised and unsupervised learning. Uh, I did want to acknowledge the authors of the original Isolation Forest paper. Um, I think it is a very elegant approach. Uh, again, kind of a wacky idea to say, hey, let's, let's overfit decision tree models to our data, and that's actually going to be useful. Thanks very much, Q&A.